subscribe to bless dark for your dose of art architecture and design and hit the bell icon so you never miss an update uh hello welcome to the channel architect sanjapuri i mean uh people have been waiting for this interview for a while i have a lot of questions that i want to ask you and know your life journey so thank you so much for taking out the time and being on the channel thanks ashok and for that extremely long follow up that you did so <laughs> that's completely all right all right so um i want to start our discussion today going back to your younger years and you know going back to your college days what actually got you interested in architecture in the first place you know i was really good at art in school and i wanted to be an artist and then at the age of 16 or 17 i read the uh, book fountain head and that was my first introduction to architecture and by the end of that book i was like no i want to be an architect only after reading the book i realized why i you know i enjoyed cardboard modeling in school and that was when we didn't even know you know what it is to create a house or anything but at like 13 and 14 year doing cardboard modeling and i had done carpentry also and metal works also so in our school we had all these opportunities so i was studying in mayo college as well and it's got these uh, you know huge opportunities for every kind of thing that you want to learn so i did all that and i found that it really interested me so that was the beginning and then at 18 when i just finished junior college i i asked my father i said do you know any architects because this book paints a very rosy picture about architecture i want to actually work with an architect and find out is it really like this or not and so he took me to a very well known contractor at that time called subhash gogia and as subhash gogia said that uh, he want to work then i can you know i know all the architects i'm working with all the designers in bombay so tell me who you want i said i don't even know anyone so you tell me so he asked me to join a piece contractor that time who had just started his office 9 months prior to that so i went to his office without any education in architecture and then he took me on i was a fifth person in the office there were only four people before that and it was just one small room of 40 by 40 feet where you enter the door and you bang into the second floor and then uh, on the left is this table and the front there we saw the large drafting tables because everything was hand drafted that time so i was made to uh, first just help everyone else in the office and then uh, he said uh, actually it was a great learning because he said any time anybody goes to site you go with them go observe find out ask questions learn so i went to sites and then uh, i was also asked to actually supervise the site stay on site until that site completed the handover you know the last handover moment the last two weeks so i did that then i worked on a set of working drawings for a big housing complex on pcl so prior to actually admission in college of architecture i had done working drawings of a hotel working drawings of a housing complex i had uh, gone through the finishing and supervising of two interior sites plus i had gone and measured and crafted and met clients also so it was uh, it was amazing i mean those three months i literally you know went through all what what happens in architecture what happens in interior site which was exposed to everything else and yes it was really exciting like the book said so i mean this is really- this is one of the things uh, you know uh, and it got me really interested in your journey as well is because you know people usually go from an educational background then into the field and there's a huge gap between the two as well when you go out from college and into the field but you started with the field and then you went into the education program and also i read that you were working all five years of education uh yeah in the office because the, yes because i was already you know so that is credit to hafiz for having given me that opportunity and said that he saw that i was capable of doing things so he actually allowed me at that age 18 to handle the project i remember once he came back to office he said oh, what did you take the measurements of that place i said yeah he said have you made the plan i said yeah he said have you called the client i said no i said i'm not going to call the client he said why not you call the client go meet him show him that you already done it so you know the kind of confidence that he instilled and he he made it sound like you know nothing is too big 
just go and do it. So, you know, that's that's an amazing amount of confidence to get at that age. At 18, you go and meet a client on your own and uh, you also told me at that time that don't tell anybody that you're not yet an architect. <laughs> so, yeah, because then the, the client will not take you seriously. So I did that. I mean, it was it was a great experience. And then, obviously, because that was happening so much and that was so exciting because you're seeing real things coming up. So I decided that I would work for all five years, however tough it gets. And it did get tough. I can imagine you're doing calling from 7.30 a.m. to 1.30. From 1.30, then you're running to office. You come back at 9, 9.30. And then you start working on college submissions. So there were like so many weeks where you, you know, you really spent one hour, two hours sleeping like that. But I think it was all worth it. Well, that is incredible. And and that is surely uh, inspiration to a lot of people. Um, so upon your graduation, uh, you joined a fees contractor full-time and worked there for four more years, post which you also then went on to start your own practice. Was the goal from the start uh, to to get on and start your own practice or, or was it something that evolved when you were working? No, I think it was something that totally evolved. You know, what happened also is that uh, while I was in second year of college, uh, somebody asked me to do an interior. And I said, uh, they said, are you capable of doing an interior since you've been working? I said, yeah, of course. So it was just a toilet, just one bathroom. But I did that bathroom. And then the contractor who came for that bathroom said that, you know, I have a client who wants to do a small office in Nadia. Would you be interested? So I said, yeah, why not? So I went and met this client, and that was Apar Industries was actually my first client. So this is second year of college, okay? And I did that office. He told me how much time it would take. So I said, it take two months. He said, no, we really want it in two months. If we can deliver it in two months, that would be great. So we delivered it in, I think, uh, five days prior to the time, closing time, um, prior to the 60 days. So he was very impressed. So then after that, I got uh, you know the computer labs to do and the science laboratory. Lots of stuff happened in that college over that whole period. So now you want to listen to my schedule in second year of college. Okay, so 7.30 to 1.30, normal days, like I said before, was college. Then was Hafiz's office. Then you come back and work on college submissions. Every Saturday night, I went unreserved by train overnight to Nadia. Worked the whole Sunday, took the next train back Sunday night, unreserved again, because there was no time for me to go and reserve my own tickets and stuff like that. And nothing was online. You have to physically go to a station. So you land in the morning at 6 o'clock, go home, change, and go back to college. And that was the routine for like a long period of time. It was crazy, but it was fully worth it. So like I said, that whole evolved thing, when you start doing things on your own, you realize that, you know, that, okay, maybe I have a different line of thinking. And I, I want to do it this way. And then uh, when when you do a lot of that, then you realize that you don't want to take now somebody else's decision. You would rather take your own decision. So it's in that way it evolved. And that's how you ended up finally, you know, doing uh, starting on practice. Also, it was a huge stroke of luck. So while in college, I did all these projects, there were some 20, 23 projects that I did while I was a student and working on my own. After finishing, then I was uh, full-time with Hafiz and then we were doing a crazy amount of work and it was actually no breathing time. I had a team of 14 people working under me. And then uh, there was this uh, call that came from a prospective artist. He said that, uh, you know, I have a client here who wants to do the elevation of a building. Will you do it on your own? So I said, elevation, who's going to do it? I will do it from plan onwards. <laughs> so the guy said, just come and meet him because it seems like it's uh, it's not a small job. So I went and met him. This guy opens the layout of 15 buildings. So he said, I want elevation of this. So I said, no, but uh, just elevation. You know, as architects over there, you don't want to do an elevation of somebody else's building. But this guy said, he said, my plans are already approved. I have to start marketing this project in a month's time. So I really don't have the choice. I would love for you to do the plan, but I don't have the time to do the plan. I don't have the time to go back to DMC. So this is it. You want to do it? You say yes, you do it. Otherwise, it's gone. So I did it. And it was a good thing that I did it because 
sometimes you know this luck and because of that project i did several other projects for the same developer for sake developers and in one day and this is the only time i got to go to my own site was on a sunday because i was the only day free so every sunday i was working and uh, one sunday i landed up in his office just to say hi to him and he was sitting in this really large you know sheet of paper in front of him so he is telling me he said how does this look as a housing there i said wow that's huge man how big is this so he is a 54 acres i'm like wow that's really big so he said how is the layout work i said the layout is terrible he said how can you say that in 2 seconds i said because i can see that the buildings are all overlapping buildings and you know looking at the scale i think this is not more than 4 5 meters so if you have a, have a building overlooking another building at 4 5 meters all through the layout everywhere there was some 100 150 buildings in that i said this is a terrible layout so he said how can you improve the layout because you have height restriction so i said you have to pick up right now so i had actually gone to say hi to him i landed up sitting there for 3 hours putting tracing paper over tracing paper and convincing him that he can do much better layout and i made a layout he said that you got so much green it's not possible because you done something wrong you miscalculated i proved to him that the same number of buildings because even though it's a sketch it's done on scale he said no no i still don't believe you take this back work on it and come back let's meet tomorrow night so it was like that and uh, we managed to convince him <laughs> and that was a 54 acre layout with the uh, 3000 apartments two schools an office building and it was layout from the point of master planning onwards and we submitted those plans working all night all night all night because we in day i was in office and that approval came through really fast and when that approval came through this guy called and said sanjay it's time for you to leave and start on your own because i can't have an architect who's working somewhere else i need an architect who is fully available for this project at all times so that's how i started well that that is quite amazing uh, and especially how you got it i also want to touch upon you know when you were doing so much work and especially when you went back to your college days and you were you know working and then going and working at hafiz and then uh, i mean studying uh, office then doing your own work college assignments there is a lot of talk nowadays that comes uh, and and obviously we become much more aware about mental health about fatigue about burnouts that happen did those happen to you back then when you were doing so much no on the contrary that's what kept you going because it's you know each thing was exciting see college is something that you have to do but irrespective there were some really good professors who taught really well at that time in the academy of architecture and i still remember knew this guy called really good you really good and and there was a bunch of them who were really good so you obviously need that office you want to go to because you want to see how the project is shaping up and i want to go on site i want to see the same i want to see that thing this meeting that the same and you got responsibility so you obviously the buck stops at you so you want to make sure that that is done and then then in the middle of all this you got personal work that has come your way where you are the boss from day one now why would you not do that that's crazy that gives you another level of satisfaction on the bill so each thing had its own level of satisfaction and you you just cannot let any of it go so you wanted all of it and more so seriously you really wanted all of it and more so there was zero going out it's really what kept you going that's amazing all right so your practice started in 1992 and this year is obviously 2022 that's 30 years of practice uh i wanted to know yes uh how in your opinion how has the profession evolved over the last 30 years and how has your practice evolved as well the profession so obviously is going on evolving all the time but i also feel that there was a time earlier when people spent a lot more time on a single project than they do now people today don't tend to go into details you know they look at a photograph and tell a contractor ki aise bana do just make it like this but that's not the way right you need to understand for yourself how it works and if you are convinced that it works well then yes you go and get it done you don't take the shortcut so today i find that there are a lot of shortcuts being taken which is not good at the same time software is allowing you so much more exploration in so many different directions that it's unbelievable what you can actually you know accomplish 
in terms of form and surfaces and the way light enters the place. And you can study literally every single thing before. I know in a university, you the whole study of where the natural light will reach each part of it and then tweak some features so that it allowed more natural light to come to places that was not enough and stuff like that, you know. So there are softwares that are allowing you to literally control the amount of sunlight that enters the place, what the ventilation, how you can reduce air conditioning, all of that in very initial stages. There is VR today, which allows you to physically, literally physically experience the space prior to building it. So there's, in terms of software, we've come like miles ahead. So that's the good side. So that's, in short, the first few things that came to mind about where the profession has gone. Your second part of the question was... Uh, How has your practice evolved again in the last 30 years? Originally, to be very frank, you know, you, you do a design, but you don't necessarily think too much on it. When you started out, you, you in a way, are, you know, the client is telling you, like, I want like this, I want like this, and you go by that. But then over a little period, you start realizing, you know, the it's not that, you know, there are, there are better ways to do it and you got to convince the client. So every time you got to convince somebody that what you are doing is actually much better for them. And it's a tough fight. People think it becomes damn easy, but it's not. Even today, to convince a client to do something new is a really tough exercise. And you've got to keep convincing, got to keep convincing. You know, and you have to have conviction in what you're doing. I realize that once you have the conviction, it, then literally it'll be very rare that a person turns you down finally. When they finally see that what you're doing is really good for them in every way possible, then they will accept and you will get your chance and your opportunity to do something that is unique and different and exciting to experience. Yeah, and also evolve in this way is, I think there's a lot of uh, evolving that happened by going to old conferences and exhibitions. It just opened up your mind totally. I mean, look at the stuff people are doing in Bangkok, in Vietnam. Look at, look at the kind of architecture that is happening in Canada, for example. So different from what is happening in South Africa. So different from what is happening in Brazil. So you go there, you meet the architects from these places, and you experience their projects because they are explaining them. And you understand the thought process and as to why what was done. And that story is really important and it really teaches you a lot. And every time you go on, you come back thinking that, no, I, you know, I have not yet done enough effort and I still need to do more effort to make a project which is far more contextual. It really should belong to its place and yet be totally unique. So you learn a lot in the Architecture Biennale, World Architecture Festival, in the plan events, lots of events like this worldwide. Coming to your projects, what are some of your personal favorites from the ones you've worked on and created over the years? Okay, so one would be, uh, the first one would be uh, the courtyard house in the hour, which is a really large, yeah. which is really large 36,000 square feet house, which we built in exposed concrete. And the whole reason why we built in exposed concrete is because it was uh, for the company Shri Cement. And they, they, they make cement. And surprisingly, they had never built anything purely in cement until then, until that house. So that came out really interesting, very abstract, very unique, very different. Every room has its own volume. So, you know, unlike most houses where you design something and then you say, okay, this floor height is going to be 12 feet, or this floor height is going to be 14 feet, whatever. And the first floor will have again 12 feet or 14 feet or XYZ. Here, the house is fragmented into this, uh, you know, based on what the requirements were. Like there are about eight bedrooms and two living spaces, there's a gym, there's a kitchen, there's a study, all of that. But every room is individual in the sense that it's got different ceiling lights all over. So it's, every room is an identity on its own. And yet it is integrated into that whole house. So it was a very, uh, it's a very abstract composition. So to have somebody first accept that kind of design and then go ahead and build it, and it's, it's really wow. And even you go back today, and you see it, and you get the kind of satisfaction that you get looking at it, it's amazing. So that is one of them. One was Ishatwam 9, which he did in Ranchi, which was a very unique building when it was done. And it's uh, unique in the sense that every room opens into these 24 feet high balcony. 
and then this is twist that happens in each case. And the twist people think is for elevation sake, which it is not. So the opposite ends, you know, uh, popping out, which means that when you have shadow, a balcony is partially shaded and partially over the sunlight. So which means that a balcony is acting as a semi terrace and a semi balcony. Whereas a balcony in a normal building is balcony over balcony over balcony, so they're all covered. So if the sun is behind you, it's always going to be in shadow. Whereas a terrace is completely open to the sky, right? So it's a completely open to the sky. But completely open to the sky is great. But if you're doing a small plot and you're making a vertical building, you don't have the space to terrace actually. So that's what it achieved. A very unique mix of a semi-balcony, semi-terrace to every single room in every single apartment in the entire building. That was very exciting. Moving to some projects that have that may not be necessarily be made by you, but have inspired you uh, over the years. They may be even ancient projects that, that you might love to go back to, but something that has inspired you. So one serious inspiration was from this uh, Sveti Stefan. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a tiny little island in Montenegro. So Montenegro anyway is a very small country with five lakhs people population. And we got a project to do that. And that's when I noticed this thing that, you know, there's this little uh, pedestrian pathway going into the sea and there's this little island, like a little, really tiny island. I said, what is that? Everybody says, Fethi Sepan. So I said, what is Fethi Sepan? So it's, it's a 600-year-old village which has been converted into an Amman resort right now. So I said, I, I have to go and stay here to experience that because it just looks amazing. And I went there. So these guys, the hoteliers have taken that 600-year-old village, taken those original structures and then made each one of those structures into a room. So every room in that hotel is different. They just have about 25, 40 rooms. Every room is different. Uh, sorry, every, yeah, every room is different. It's located in a different part with a different view of the surrounding sea from all sides. And then you have this uh, cafe space which is on the topmost, at the topmost side with a swimming pool. It's so natural, it is so beautiful from your room. There are like five different ways to go to the cafe. And every time you go, you can take a different path. So it's like a constant, you know, you just experience something different every time. And there's a surprise, you know. Oh, wow, I can go from here also. So actually, every time you stayed in those two days, we took a different path just to explore. Otherwise, which hotel allows you to do that? There's always one path, right? There's one path. In most buildings, there's only one way to go from here to there. But here, you know, there were so many different ways, and that's what made it exciting. And then, as that's the time when I realized that, you know, organic spaces are far more interesting and far more, uh, you know, interactive than the planned geometric ones. So that was a huge learning. There was uh, there were another two, three buildings, which was really amazing. One was... Uh, the Jewish Museum at Berlin by Daniel Libeskin. Amazing building to experience. I mean, literally, you are being forced to go along that path in that serpentine manner, in these angles, and then light comes in from somewhere. So, I mean, the interior also went so well. With it. So it was beautiful, that building to experience. The MIT Stata Center by Franco Gehry. Another absolutely brilliant building to experience. I mean, mind-blowing the way, you know, it's not just about the sculptural spaces and the forms. People think it's all about, you know, all these twisted shapes, but it's not. That building is a building to experience. You know, suddenly you, you walk in there and there's this open terrace, and then there is uh, sunlight coming from this direction. Then there is a semi-enclosed space. And then there's this color, then there's this graphic wall. And it's, it's amazing to experience. Then another one yet was... Uh, the what's the bank? The Norddeutsche Bank in Hanover. That building, wow, stunning building. I mean, who would have thought an office building is going to have this mad abstract, you know, down in first floor with sloping roofs, and then the building stepping out in this direction, then stepping out in that direction, then stepping back. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's by Benish and Benish. Beautiful, amazing, amazing office building. And then there is uh, one more that I must mention, which is, uh, it's a theater in Dresden, very small city in Germany, done by Kuhl Himmelblau. 
And you know, as an architect, and when you see so many drawings, you see so many designs, you know, you, you look at a building and you can actually draw the plan in a few minutes. You go in and you understand how the layout is, and you can draw it. I mean, it's very simple. This building, for the first time, I like totally foxed. I said, wow, how did this happen? Because it is abstract to another level. So I sat there literally for 45 minutes, just, just enjoying being there in that volume. And if architecture can do that, you that each one wants to sit in a place, just because that place feels so good, then I think you've achieved it. So that was by Cooper and Blau. Really, really interesting. I have seen, I mean, and I've researched some of them, but I will, the rest I will surely research. They sound amazing. They're worth it. You know, for the past two years, we've had COVID all over the world, which has, uh, you know, uh, it has impacted different businesses. It has impacted people a lot. Uh, how have uh, you and your firm be coping up with, with COVID and everything that has been happening? So I guess we are doing it like everybody else. So everybody is working from home and, uh, you know, only, of course, in the first lockdown, it was necessary. And then we continued for a while because we found that it is, although the output is not the same, but still it's, you know, people are safe. They'd rather work in their own environment. So it's fine. A lot of coordination took much longer than what it would if you were face-to-face in person. And now we've uh, got the office functioning with few people only. So it, and people are free to come when they want to come and they can make their own schedules. As long as they come once or twice in a week, it's okay because you need that little bit of interaction because it just makes things faster, that's all. Otherwise, even uh, online working is perfectly fine on that it works well. But then as architects, we need to go to sites, right? Unfortunately, in India, you know, everything doesn't go. However good your working drawing is, it is not going to get translated True. the way you want it if you don't land up going to that site. So that's the biggest challenge. You need to go to sites. And yeah. that is something you've got. Another crisis that sort of is coming towards us is the climate crisis, which obviously has been in the news for the past few years, much more than ever before, because it is increasing at an alarming rate. As architects, um, uh, one, what do you think should be our outlook towards the climate crisis and, and uh, how it's just inching closer? You know, architects are one of those who can make a maximum amount of difference. So if we start building sustainably, using materials that are sustainable, are sustainable to produce, not just, you know, not simple things like using low-E glass, but actually using materials that have been produced sustainably. So everybody, I think, is moving in that direction, slowly, slowly. And uh, hopefully there would be rules put in place so that it becomes necessary. Because until it comes as a rule, I don't see that kind of following happening as it should. And the few of us who are trying to do it, are not going to make that much difference. So if it's a rule, it'll make a huge amount of difference because then it becomes mandatory that you have to use materials like this. A lot of ways, but at least everybody recognizes the need and everybody is doing their own, you know, a little bit go from furniture, from small products to large buildings. People have become aware and they are taking measures to build in a more sustainable way. But you think much more can come out of, of policy decisions that might uh, help limit certain materials and promote others and uh, processes? Yeah. Absolutely. Much, much more will come. Because see, this is India. I mean, I understand that people are not going to take that extra mile or go that extra mile unless it is mandatory for them. True. Otherwise, how many will do it? Few will do it, very few. The percentage will be really small. But if you make it a rule, then it just becomes mandatory for everyone to do it. All right, moving on to another topic that has, uh, and one of the last topics for the day, a topic that has been in the news a lot lately is the metaverse. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of buzz around it. A lot of architects and uh, architecture firms are sort of planning to embrace it and sort of planning to work with it. Uh, what, is, what are your thoughts when it comes to the metaverse and would you be experimenting with it? Yes, we would be, of course. We are waiting uh, for it to become 
easier, more accessible, and then we start doing it. So to an extent, everybody is already doing you know, at some level. Some it'll just make processes, collaborations, all of that much easier. True. In one of my latest videos, I also proposed that my with if it becomes that widespread, then we might even see a second profession come up of a virtual architect. where people uh, you know just design for the metaverse and and the education and the qualification for that would be very different from what you need to be an architect because none of the rules apply in in a digital that's world true. <laughs> that's true i feel a lot of people stop yeah but there are already people doing this there are already people doing this there are there are many architects who like properly shifted to becoming virtual architects and creating virtual buildings uh but yeah. you know one of the propositions i made you know it was it could also be a teenager next who just has an interesting outlook towards forms of of how people will interact in the digital realm and it might not be somebody you know because architects uh, the profession takes a long time to master and that is why well known architects are always much older is because it takes time to learn the skill <laughs> it takes time to uh, execute even as well Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There are projects which have been sitting on on the paper for five years, six years before it gets implemented, and there are projects that start getting implemented for some reason or the other. They keep getting delayed, and then they True. go into what could have finished in twelve months, is taking like three years and four years to finish. Yeah. So yeah, it is it is a long profession. So yes, you are absolutely right. I mean, I think you see a lot of great stuff. We already are, and you see a lot more. Yeah. All right. One final thing uh, that I wanted to ask you, and this I ask every guest on the channel, is uh, if you could give some advice to young students or young graduates who've just got out of architecture school for their profession and their life ahead. So my advice would be to gain experience. Today, I find that most people, most of the young people, young, there are a lot of them in our office. Are in a hurry, you know. They are in a hurry to go to the next step, to go to the next level, to start your own office, whatever. Everything is. They expect that everything will happen really fast. It does not happen fast in reality. So you need to give it time, and you need to give it time so that you are able to understand what actually goes into a building. I mean, I have seen people come here in two years, and then some uncle or friend or somebody has given a small project, and they are out to start their own practice. But you haven't learnt enough yet. And if you have not yet learned, and you think you're going to learn on the job, you you are only going to get those small kind of jobs. So you you really need to get the experience, and it's not going to be a quick fix solution. You need to get the experience. Minimum amount of time that you should work is about five or six years prior to start setting up your own office. And also, when you are working, choose your form carefully and work in one form so that you actually get to see those projects implemented. If you're going to jump like on a daily basis, just for the fun of it, I always say that you know I'll get five different experiences instead of one. And then it again doesn't work because you will not even go through a project. So if you've not gone through a project, you've not learned. It's really important to stay in a place and to give it time and understand and execute, go on site and work details out, understand how things work. You know, you need to get into the depth and understand how things work. Everything is not superficial. Everything cannot happen like a quick fix solution. And experience, experience, very important. Also, is to experience real buildings. You can't only see them in images or in videos. Videos, yes, are a little better, but the physical aspect of being in that building and actually experiencing that space is unparalleled. True. And no video and no photograph comes close to the real experience. So you need to actually go and experience for a better understanding. These are True. two important things. Perfect. That is some uh, brilliant, brilliant advice. Especially uh, what you said about experiencing, because there it, it there is no comparison of. Uh, you can obviously take out brilliant images. You can take out brilliant videos, shots of of any projects. but to really uh, understand what that project does especially you know inside and, and on an experiential level would only come when you're physically present so um, true that is some fantastic advice and thank you so much for taking out the time 
uh to come and talk to the audience and and answer the questions and that was it you guys that was my interview with architect sanjay puri let me know how you found it in the comments below also if you like interviews like these and the other content that i produce on this channel you can help support it by becoming a channel member you can find the join button below or you can find more details in the description also you can support this channel via patreon the link for that will be in the description as well anyways do not forget to give this video a thumbs up to share this video and to subscribe to bless dark and do hit that bell icon so you're notified whenever a new video comes out i will see you guys soon with more such content bye bye